Thank you, Roz. I hadn't realized until you read that bio that I think I picked uh, as many multisyllabic words as possible. <laughs> so uh, good, good thing to work on in the future. And uh, also, I'm, I'm really gratified that you all came out today because after I had submitted uh, the title and background for publicity, I realized the title of this presentation is, is a little bit abstract. Uh, mapping tools is straightforward enough. Uh, I think and hope the different thing about these mapping tools is they're really intended to make you all the experts on the topic I'm going to address. Uh, for a long time, uh, geographic analysis has sort of been the purview of people you know, with special skills and software. Uh, I think that wall is dissolving uh, faster than I can even imagine. Uh, the abstract part, though, is mobility alternatives, because if I were just looking at this, thinking about whether to come, I would say alternatives to what? Uh, I didn't want to make an even longer title block, so uh, for, for purposes of our discussion today, we'll say there are alternatives to single occupant vehicle trips. Now, uh, why would we care to provide alternatives for single occupant vehicle trips? Uh, I think environmental benefits is one. Obviously, pollution, uh, both, both air and, and water pollution associated with vehicles. Uh, I think public health could be another consideration. How can we get more uh, passive mode exercise in? And uh, I think most importantly, because I don't want to overemphasize either of those two, uh, are, are considerations of quality of place. Because it's very hard uh, to create, in, in my view, uh, great memorable places uh, when we're accommodating tens of thousands of cars going through and, and the parking of same. Now, whenever I introduce this topic, though, uh, I feel like there's a little bit of, of a suspension of disbelief that needs to occur. Uh, I don't need to tell you that we have some weather challenges for, for creating more walk trips and bike trips. More daunting is the fact that the region uh, that we cover for transportation planning uh, is over 8,000 square miles. Almost all of this is laid out at, at an automotive scale. And so uh, if, if I were looking at this coming at it uh, clean, I would start to scratch my head and say, where do we start? Well, that is the premise of, of the presentation today. And, and the talk uh, that I'm going to give you on our mapping tools. I think we have uh, somebody in transportation help me out. We, we've got almost 20,000 miles of major thoroughfares in the region. And I don't know if the vast majority of them would fit into this category, but uh, certainly many, if not most of them do. That's 1960, by the way. I want to just uh, not, but we, we could substitute that with, with many other roadways in the region. And uh, I think what you can see, it's, it's, it's sort of the worst of all possible worlds for pedestrians. Uh, the land uses are spread out. Uh, a lot of times they're fenced or otherwise disconnected. Uh, in some cases, we've got uh, deep ditches running along the roadside. Even if we wanted to put in sidewalks, it would be difficult to do so. Very high speeds, uh, very few safe places to cross. Uh, you can't have a whole ton of crossings or you'd include traffic. And so, uh, and I don't want to upset anybody who's, who's very interested in complete streets and, and the like, but uh, I'm just going to say that we, I don't think there's much we're ever going to do with facilities like this to really make them high quality pedestrian and bicycle environments. That does not mean that we can't do better. Uh, you know, almost, I think 9% of our population doesn't have access to a vehicle. So I think there are some, some small fixes we could do uh, to make it safer for that individual who may not have a car, may not have another choice in how to get around. But as far as how we should spend public resources uh, to, to create these mobility alternatives, I think we need to take much more of a surgical approach. Now, some of you may be familiar, for the last seven years or so, we've been working on a program called Livable Centers. And the uh, ochre colored dots are the, the studies we've done on that so far. Uh, we've also been working on something called pedestrian bicyclist special districts. Those are the green dots. Uh, these are a little bit larger areas. But our thesis on this is that uh, pedestrians especially, but uh, even bicyclists, they, they don't really want to ride 10 miles anywhere. There, there are a few who do, but, but most of that is an orbital pattern, and we would do a better job looking at how to connect people to a lot of destinations in a district 
than just expressed in terms of miles of bikeway. Now, I'm going to just give you two examples of these studies. Some of them are in very obvious places, like Midtown. I think if, if most of you were to try to conjure up a vision on you know, what's, what's a potential walkable transit supportive place, uh, Midtown Houston would come to mind. And I think a lot of the land use there tends to, uh, tends to reinforce that. Uh, we did a ped bike special district study though on North Airline. Uh, I'm guessing that's probably a 40s, 50s era thoroughfare. And I think when the, I'm not cracking on the engineers of that facility, uh, when that road was designed, I don't think anyone ever imagined the amount of pedestrian traffic that it would have today as a result of all the flea markets there. So I, I think some of the, the targeted strategies uh, we could almost pick out ourselves without mapping tools. Uh, other than maybe a little bit surprising to you. And so uh, as we've done now 22 uh, livable centers studies and I think about nine special district studies, there, there's really two main factors I think that are the recipe for success of, of actually getting people walking, getting people biking, and getting people onto transit. Uh, and the first, I guess the academic term for it is activity density, but it's basically stuff close together. Uh, people and jobs close together. Uh, now in Houston, a lot of these, as you'll see in a minute, are, are mainly daytime population. We've got concentrations of workers downtown in the Texas Medical Center. And uh, the, the thought exercise I would ask you to do is, you know, you, you can actually go to a business meeting downtown, uh, probably take a tunnel, but it is in, it's quite possible to walk to, to what we call a purpose-driven trip. Similarly with the Med Center, you know, if lab tech needs to uh, take some test results down, they can probably cross a skywalk and get that done. Uh, if those were in uh, perhaps a suburban office park on a freeway frontage road that didn't have a lot of opportunities for turning around, uh, those, those could be you know, five, seven mile vehicle trips. So obviously the, the concentration of the people close together, uh, particularly in those big employment centers, uh, is a, a great uh, opportunity to reduce vehicle trips. Uh, on a little bit smaller scale though is, is what some of the city planners uh, like to refer to as the mixed use areas where we may not have the scale of a downtown or a TMC, but we've got uh, lots of activities that are close together. One point I want to make about people and jobs, uh, we'll talk about commute in a minute, but uh, a job may or may not be something you're going to walk to or take transit to, but uh, for, for those of you interested in, in travel modeling, uh, you know, all trips have an origin and a destination. And jobs are a good surrogate for destinations. So in a place that has a lot of people and jobs close together, even if people aren't walking to work, that, that job might be a Starbucks or a school or a library or some other facility that you're going to walk to. So it's, it's a good uh, uh, measure if you don't have the specific uh, information of, of uh, where, where people might take that trip. But that's only one piece of it. That, that's about the people and the buildings, and that's very important. Uh, but infrastructure is important too. And the concept here uh, we refer to as street connectivity. Uh, basically, it's just how, how close is that trip for a pedestrian or a bicyclist uh, to how the crow would fly. And here's an example. Let's see if I've got this on multiple screens. Uh, so if, if you live here in Montrose and you want to go to the uh, Agora coffee shop, your, your walking trip is scarcely longer than the crow would fly. So that, that's good for a pedestrian. You don't want to have to uh, add a lot of extra miles, particularly in our Houston heat. Now, this is city center. Great facility. Has a lot of the, the mixed use and, and walkable amenities that I think we all would like to uh, see more of in this area. But if you live over here, you would have to walk almost a mile to get to the city center. Uh, might be daunting, even though you live uh, less than a quarter mile away. So when we talk about street connectivity, it's, it's really giving people those options uh, to walk and, and make different directional choices. So as we started uh, thinking about this, we looked at uh, some research. Those of you who are interested, uh, Newman and Kentworthy, uh, they did a lot of analysis, uh, cities all over the world, at what level do you really start seeing people making meaningful numbers of walking trips? 
And so uh, zooming in, this is Loop 610. Uh, wh where are those gold zones in Houston, as it were? Uh, not surprisingly, downtown and immediate surroundings, uh, that threshold would, would uh, be pretty much met there. Texas Medical Center, Rice, as we said again. And then we've sort of got this larger one that is Greenway on out to Sharpstown. So those are the places that have the, the so-called activity density uh, that would support walking. Uh, this, this blue, less smooth uh, shape is where we've got the optimum number of intersection density to provide that crow fly option for the pedestrian. Now, I also added just for fun, uh, the uh, red is sort of the minimum threshold of residential density uh, to drive walk-up trips uh, to transit. Now, we've had our red line open for about 10 years now. Uh, I don't know a lot of people who ride it, although I know people who live and work in that corridor do. But when I ask them why, uh, it's not necessarily because the destinations they want to reach are not on it. Uh, it's because they would have to drive and park somewhere or take a bus, transfer, and get on it. So these, these red zones are places where we have uh, sufficient residential density uh, to support walk-up, high-volume walk-up transit service. So if I were going to do uh, just, just a very simple one-map uh, mobility alternatives exercise, I would say, you know, in these areas where we've got uh, good activity density, good transit supportive density, um, but we, uh, we, I'm sorry, let me back up on that. Where, where we've got activity density and uh, no grid, that's, that's problematic. That's, that's more like skywalks right of way uh, in power line easements or whatever. Uh, it's hard to punch a grid through. Uh, where you've got grid without density, uh, that might be a good place to look at our incentive programs. Uh, where we've got a good covalence of the three, uh, I think those are the areas where we really could focus on complete streets uh, and more investment in, in pedestrian bike facilities. Interestingly enough, uh, that is the Westheimer curve. Uh, so if you want to think about the, the sweet spot uh, in Houston for potential uh, walkable mobility, uh, it would be right there. We've done some playing around with this. This, this assumes an eventual university line uh, just for fun. Uh, if, if that happens, you'll see that Metro, we didn't consult with them. Uh, I think they did a pretty good job of citing that line. and. Uh, connecting those, those key areas. But uh, the, the problem with this is it's, it's just a static map. Uh, if you wanted to do something with that map, you would probably have to call our GIS team here and it would take us a while to do. Uh, we really wanted to see if there was a way that we could put more of that power into your hands uh, to do this kind of analysis on your own. Now, this is the scariest part of any presentation, uh, attempted live demo. So we, we uh, tested it before, and so we're going to have a little leap of faith. I also apologize, doing what I'm about to do on these big maps uh, may induce vertigo. So uh, please, uh, I apologize in advance. You, you may need to just avert your eyes here. But uh, this is in honor of those early maps. We, we call it the blue map uh, tool, although I don't know that it really would need to be called that, uh, just our little skunk works title. And this tool exists in two forms. Uh, there is something called a summary viewer that I'm guessing about 90% of you would, would want to use. Uh, and then we have an advanced viewer that uh, will have some other functionality. I'm not going to go into as much depth on that. Uh, but the nice thing about these maps, uh, in addition to the fact that you can use them uh, at your leisure and, and really to do your own analysis, is that uh, they're also updated. So it, we don't have to just wait using old census or old land use data. These maps are, are fed with the current year data from our long range uh, forecasting and estimation program, land use program. Uh, that will come into play in just a minute. So let's see where this sweet spot activity density exists in our eight county region. So you, you select one, there, there's a uh, predefined menu uh, that just goes by percentiles. Uh, more on that in a minute. So you select apply. Not much there, but let's zoom in a little bit and see where the places are today that would support uh, significant numbers of walk trips. Takes a second to load. So Woodlands around the mall and Water Street area, 
That's probably the furthest one north. Got a long way to go till the next one comes up, but uh, eastern portion of Greens Point. And now we're getting down, so we're coming up to Loop 610 here. And this is where it starts to look like the map I already showed you. So you got the big zones again. These have grown a little bit since uh, that was, uh, I think, 2010 data with the old map. So we've got central Houston, which kind of is, is a little bit of near north side, east downtown, midtown, good chunk of Montrose. We've got the Texas Medical Center in Rice represented. And then we've got this, this very large and interesting one, I think, that goes from Greenway Plaza over to the Galleria and, uh, for lack of a better term, Greater Sharpstown. And just uh, if you're interested technically, what, what the computer does is it tries to create the largest polygon it can that still, uh, as a whole, uh, meets the average number. So let's go see where the rest of them are. This one kind of surprised me. Uh, West Chase, uh, significant density, uh, could support probably a lot more uh, potential walk trips or circulator trips. Uh, this one was kind of interesting to me too, the, the Westwood area. Uh, that's, that's probably more residential than jobs based. Let's see where else we got some. Memorial City Mall, some areas of the energy corridor, not the whole thing. Let's zoom back out and see if we missed any. I think that's the main ones. So let's see how we're doing on the street connectivity side of things. So we're going to go down to the optimum intersection density. Again, these are, are set up in 10% in, uh, increments. So just click it and apply. And sorry, we, we have a semi-opaque overlay, but I hope you can still see that. So again, you see we've got a really good covalence in this, in this near downtown one. We've got some other areas where we've got a pretty good grid, but uh, not too much density today could accommodate more. The interesting thing, I think, though, when we look at this, this uh, street grid analysis is that that is a lot more dispersed. So we've got some of our suburban areas and smaller towns that had the historical town grid. Uh, I think that's important because even though it may take a long time for the market to be interested in putting any sort of density in these areas, uh, th those grids are, are mostly here to stay if we don't close them up. Uh, like I said before, it's very hard, most of uh, eastern Galveston, for example, it's very hard to uh, get those new street connections in uh, once development has occurred. So that is a way that you can kind of see these, these intersections of opportunity uh, within uh, both the street system and the uh, places where people live and work. One thing, though, that you'll notice is that our top activity density zones are very skewed towards daytime population. Again, downtown, medical center, Greenway, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think there is an element missing from that. Maybe not large-scale walking trips, but, uh, you know, that, that can you walk to get a quart of milk in your neighborhood type trip. So we added another feature to this that uh, I think is pretty interesting looking at jobs housing ratio. And again, bear in mind, this is not necessarily uh, meant to depict places where lots of people are gonna walk to work, but with lots of jobs, that means there's lots of destinations. So these are set up in ranges. So this uh, 0.76 to 1.5 is sort of the middle range. So get ready for the reveal on where our mixed use areas are, and it's good news. There are a lot of them. So these are all the places in the region that have pretty good jobs housing balance. And uh, we, we set some minimums on this because you could have a place that had one job and one house that would look pretty good. But uh, we set a minimum of 1,500 jobs and 500 households. So it might be a little bit job weighted still. Zoom in on the center and uh, you can see all the, uh, all the obvious suspects of Montrose up to the Heights, your north side, third ward, U of H area. But zooming back out, uh, you really see some smatterings of these uh, in a lot of different locations that I think are, are pretty interesting potential. 
So let's do one more thing here. W one of the things that uh, we're, we're aware of and, and uh, wanted to make sure this tool could do is uh, I've showed you a lot of examples in Houston and in the inner loop. Uh, that's because a lot of the other areas in our eight county region don't, don't have these thresholds today. But uh, if you are interested in looking at where, where your sweet spot is, uh, that's, that's why we created this as a scalable tool. So uh, one of my favorite walkable places in the region is the, uh, see if I can get it here right, uh, the Sugarland Town Square, but it doesn't show up in the top 10 percentile. But if we go down one click, there it is. So you can, uh, irrespective of where you are in the eight counties, you can go all the way down to 10% to of the cumulative on any of these categories and kind of see where your opportunities stack up. Now I'm going to turn all these off and show you one other feature on this before we go to the next segment. It hasn't broken down yet. So I mentioned before the, uh, the minimum threshold for walk-up transit, and I'm, I'm fudging a little bit with these numbers, but uh, if we just wanted to see that, where are the places where you could support heavier service with just walk-up trips? That's where those are. And again, it's, some of these are going to be difficult to serve, but uh, those of you that have been following the uh, Metro Reimagining Project, I, I think they did a pretty good job of kind of shifting the, the locus of service into that southwest corridor uh, where that kind of density exists. Uh, we can do the same thing with employment density. So we just want to look at sort of the mega, mega centers. They're pretty obvious, uh, Greenway, Galleria, West Chase, Downtown, Med Center. I want to go down a couple notches, though. Then you can start to see the, the polynucleic form uh, that we all like to talk about. Uh, interestingly to me, you know, we talk about NASA Clear Lake as, as another one. That, that doesn't show up real big. That doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of jobs down there. Uh, it just means there aren't a lot of jobs close together. It's time for advanced viewer. So if you really want to get down and do some very small area planning, uh, the, the advanced viewer provides you that option. We, we have some other locational features on here that may be of interest. Uh, you can, for example, uh, turn on a layer of, of what we would consider to be potential ped bike destinations. Let me re-get my bearing here. So if you want to see, for example, what the library is, losing some of my icons here, promote. We, we've tried to put parks and schools other potential destinations of, of uh, walk and bike trips, because not too many people are going to bike to Costco to get their new big screen TV, but they might, uh, might bike to school. Uh, we can also look at where metro transit facilities are. We can look at current land use. etc. And uh, we've just added a new feature, some of you who may have already played with this, uh, that can enable you to do some location analysis. So we're going to go back to that uh, metro idea. So the, the coffee plant stop is here at the corner of York and Harrisburg. If you were interested in just taking a look at what was around there, uh, you can click on a point 
and you can do your typical what would uh, be within a quarter mile walk and then you can get a summary for example of land use current whoops forecasted we have set this up a uh, little bit of inside baseball on a hex grid system and uh, just that that's the way it works out the best to be able to cut these different boundaries but if you want to know what's in the grid uh, you can get a summary of uh, details on households jobs uh, other land use intersection density all, all the features we talked about on the basic viewer and if you let's go back to land use we just have non-residential square footage shown here if, if you want the whole table of all the land use category summaries uh, you can click this download uh, CSV and that promote will give you a spreadsheet with all the categories uh, so and I'm again I'm focusing on Houston because there is uh, I think more uh, density of some of these things there but we, we could uh, this is set up for uh, all of our counties the other features I want to just show you real quick on this before we move on if you're interested in doing more of a traditional buffer analysis see we want to see what is available on Westheimer whoops maybe we're doing a development uh, feasibility analysis so we'll go from uh, Kirby to Dunlavey <laughs> okay so you you can uh, sort of like we did with the circle you can do a uh, buffer we want to go half mile can do that to basically get all the same summary data for that area you've encapsulated in the buffer and then finally if you're interested in just looking at some neighborhood level details but they don't adhere to either of those boundaries you can use it as a shape building tool as well so we'll look at uh, Cherryhurst here. And let's say we just, we don't want any buffer, we just want to look at the neighborhood. So again, you could do the same, whoops, I guess I didn't turn the buffer off. At any rate, you could do the same sort of analysis for a uh, smaller area that was of irregular shape so I'm, I'm gonna move on with the next tool here we can come back to these during Q&A if you want to see what some other areas look like but the other piece I want to cover in the presentation is uh, what I would call uh, commute myth busting so when we talk about road rage and, and congestion and all that, I think there is, is this belief that the, the commute trip is, is just the worst thing. That's the biggest problem we got to solve. And uh, I'm just curious, uh, of, of major metro areas in terms of average commute time, where would you guess, what, what numerical ranking would you guess Houston Galveston has? Wonder when a hazard to guess. I saw a 10 back there. I think that might be a ringer. Any other ideas? Well, you stole my thunder here. We're, we're number 11 in terms of, of the mean travel time to work uh, for the 25 most populous metro areas. Now, 28.2 minutes is, is not a short commute, uh, but we are not the worst uh, by any means. So then the other thing I hear a lot is, well, it's just, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. So how many people think that the, uh, the commute in Houston is, is getting worse uh, than it was 10 years ago in terms of travel time? 
couple. Okay, this is a very astute, very astute crowd. Uh, no, actually, we reduced slightly uh, our average travel time in the region from 2000 to 2013. Um, interestingly to me, that the national number really went up, as did a lot of these, from 90 to 2000, and then went down uh, from 2000 to, and the most recent data we have is, is 2013. Uh, the outliers on that are two very uh, walkable and transit supported places, uh, New York City and, and Washington, D.C. By the way, these, these numbers do include uh, transit travel time and, and walking travel time, but uh, basically Houston and some of these other big Sun Belt metros have, have slightly gone down in terms of travel time. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily because of greater transit use or, or less congestion. I think it's sort of what we talked about with jobs and housing. Um, we, we've evolved into this more polycentric region. People tend to cluster around uh, where they work. Yeah, Corey. My hypothesis would be we've added hundreds of thousands of jobs, and those people, when they move into the city, probably pick a house. Right. And in fact, I think we can support that that is the case uh, in my next demo. So good, very good point. But one other myth, I, I think a myth about commute distance is, uh, you know, I hear a lot of talk about, well, we need some commuter rail. That's, that's probably the best answer for, for commuting. Um, I found this, this breakdown pretty staggering, and, and this is just the sort of out of the box from from the census data. Uh, we're we're going to try to look at this to break these down into a little bit finer layers, but almost 40 percent of the people in our region live less than 10 miles from work. And uh, Tori, I, I would guess that you are correct in, in surmising that, yeah, a lot of people uh, either in their first move or maybe a later move are going to pick someplace a little bit closer together. Um, almost 40 are, are still less than 24 miles. So this, this category here, I think, is where you'd really start getting some advantages uh, in terms of commuter rail or, or super high capacity commuter service. Uh, you know, 13% is not insignificant, but it's, it's far from everybody. On the other side of the spectrum, this, this last number just blows me away. There's almost 20% or 12% of the people in our region drive more than 50 miles. Uh, I, I don't know anybody. I guess we had somebody who used to commute from College Station here. But uh, So the next tool will help us uh, drill down a little bit on, on where people really are commuting. And so we've got this divided two ways. This is uh, promote, help me out here, longitudinal employment employer, employer household dynamic, uh, which is updated, I guess, sporadically uh, combination of census and some other data sources. But it really looks at, uh, at both the broad and the fine scale of trip origins and uh, destinations. So we, we've got this divided, depending on how you want to look at it, at, at a sector level, uh, at a county level, zip code level, and census tract level. And I'm not going to go through all these, but I'm going to zoom in on just a couple uh, that I hope you find of interest. So if we want to see where uh, people who work inside the loop are coming from, uh, you would click on that, uh, that sector here. Whoops. And you would click it again. There we go. So I found this interesting. Uh, almost 20%, as, as one might expect, of the people who work inside the loop, live inside the loop. And uh, sector nine, where is that promote? OK. Real time demos. OK, so our next biggest group is this, uh, I'm going to call that sort of North Sugarland, South Katy, and the like. So uh, again, not huge numbers of people, even though it's, it's fed by virtually every other sector, 
there aren't huge numbers of people relative to the ones in adjacent sectors uh, that are coming from far away, although in the aggregate it adds up. You can also look at it, and I find this one uh, a little bit more interesting. Uh, so where are the people who are, or where people live, uh, where are they going? So this sector might be a little bit large, but this is 290, 45, so we've sort of got Cyprus to the woodlands. Those are all commuters, right? They go long distances. Interestingly, again, uh, about 20% of them uh, work within that sector. And you look at the next category, it's out of the region, so I'm assuming College Station or Huntsville or, or other places. Look at Sector 19, which is between the, uh, the uh, Beltway, I guess that's 1960, or Grand Parkway. Okay, this is beyond Grand Parkway. Uh, sector 11, so even, even as far out as that, uh, we, we still have a pretty large number of people who are, uh, are working right in that zone. So when we talk about mobility alternatives, is, is commuter rail to here? Uh, going to be the best option or perhaps a circulator bus or some other sorts of systems. Now, Mayor Martin, this next one is just for you. We have, uh, it's ever since I've been here, this, this uh, belief that uh, everybody in Perlin Manville works in the Texas Medical Center. So we're going we're gonna to try to test that theory. So I guess yes and no. So of, of the 127,000 people in, in kind of greater Pearland Manville, um, again, about 20% of them do work inside the loop. I don't know how many of those are at the med center. But if you, if you look at the people who work right in that zone and then sort of in the hobby NASA uh, combine, that's greater than the number of people that are going inside the loop. So again, I, I kind of viewed this as a, as a myth-busting eye-opener here that uh, people are not necessarily all going in the direction we think they are, particularly when it comes to providing transit and mobility alternatives. I'm going to do one more, and then we're going to go down to the zip code. So let's pick uh, Sector 4, which is uh, South Sugar Land, Missouri City, Stafford-ish. So again, that's, that's a little bit higher. That might be about 25% uh, of people in that zone going inside the loop. Interestingly, uh, next highest category is people going outside of the region. So we, we need to do a little bit more digging on that. Uh, there is an artifact in this data that some people that don't, don't have uh, a dedicated office to commute to but work for a corporation that may have an address in Dallas or something are showing up as out of the region here. So we're, we're going to need to parse that a little bit. But again, the third highest set is people working right in that zone. And the next highest is the adjacent zone. So we really, uh, we really don't see this, this dominance of, of downtown or med center type commuting in any of the ones that I've looked at anyway. So this next one might be of more interest uh, to uh, real estate agents than uh, planner types. Let's see if I can uh, find it here. So we're going to look at zip code, and just uh, to make it totally parochial, I'm going to enter my zip code in here because I hope to know something about that. Once it loads. So I'm in 77025. I want to see where people in my neighborhood are working to see if we're going to get uh, hit very hard by, you know, layoffs of upstream uh, workers here. Apologize for the speed. So again, my neighborhood. This is kind of Stell Link, Um Largest category is the med center, 
followed by downtown, uh, Greenway Plaza, U of H, couple Galleria, West Chase. So energy corridor do doesn't really register in this zip code. So interesting and like I said, maybe some, some different uses you could uh, put that to. Let's, let's look at a uh, kind of Cinco Ranchy one. Whoop. Thank you. <laughs> I, I can uh, hopefully talk about them, but I can't, can't uh, demo them. So that's, that's uh, Grand Parkway, and I guess that's a little south of Single Ranch. Uh, so you see there are large numbers of people commuting to energy corridor jobs. Downtown's still pretty high number two, but very different commuting profile uh, than in mine. So uh, I would invite you to play around with uh, your own zip codes or others. Uh, those of you who prefer to work with census, we've got that available as well. So what, what are the takeaways that I hope you take from this is uh, that the challenge of providing mobility alternatives is, is not monolithic at all. So when we talk about 8,000 square miles and 20,000 miles of road, daunting problem, uh, I hope I've demonstrated today that opportunities exist throughout our region uh, for finding places where, where other types of investments can make some sense. Uh, it's really our aim uh, with our group to, to empower you as users, not to create an expert class of users who produce uh, you know, maps and analysis uh, that, that we deem appropriate, but to provide to the extent we can. We're not web designers, uh, but uh, we, we can provide tools, hopefully, that will uh, enable you to do better planning, uh, better advocacy, or just be better informed of some of these trends. And I think the key to doing that is, A, uh, if you will use these products, and please spread the word to others about them, and B, if you will get back to us and tell us how we can improve them, uh, we, we've presented some ideas of things uh, where the data is available, where we thought we could present uh, a tool that would be of use. If, if there's something we should add, take away, or if, if we're off the mark somehow, we'd like to get that dialogue going and make this into a little bit more of a wiki process, if you will. Uh, mic around. I'm assuming we're going to post this, but I'll, I'll leave this up for a while if you want to uh, want to. Uh, write down the links to this. You can find them hopefully on our website. If, if you don't have the URL, just uh, type in blue map or type in commute patterns into the HGAC search uh, bar and it should come up. Uh, before we get to questions, I would just like to take this opportunity though to acknowledge uh, Pramod Samidi, Sambidi and uh, Sungmin Lee. So everything I did was uh, basically advancing the slide, moving the mouse, everything that actually created these products uh, was, was done by them and, and our other staff. So uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions or comments and be happy to take those now. Jeff, there's no one here after you, so you can I think we have as long as we want for questions and comments. So, <laughs> Tori. Interesting. Right. Or even better, put in an employment place and say, here are some good places you might think about right. living based on optimization. So, sort of an a alternative mobility score, like a walk score thing. Yeah. I, I uh, don't know why that, I see Promote writing, I don't know why that wouldn't be possible. David, you had a question then. Yeah. 
Right. I, I think that's a valid point. Uh, I, I hope that with the uh, option of doing the zip codes and, and tracts, you know, we tried to slice it in some different ways. Uh, you know, irrespective of, of uh, I guess, what you're talking about in terms of the, the uh, scale issue on conveying size, I mean, the, the way people tend to think about the region, I think, is informed by these, these sectors and, and freeway boundaries. So we're, we're just trying to create it in, in a way that, you know, different users can come at it differently. Promote, I don't know that there is anything, could we do this at a grid cell level? So that's a good comment. We'll we'll see if we could do a grid or or hexagon yeah, view as well. We already have the hexagon thing. Right. Right. Good. You know, I'm sorry. I also I did, said I'd get back to it, and I, I got lost in my enthusiasm. Um, if if you want to make printed maps of this stuff uh, on the blue map, you can do that out of the advanced viewer. I don't want to take our time going through the steps of the demo. But uh, there is there's a feature, and you can turn on land use or aerials and control opacity and whatnot. So uh, if, if you're not just going to be viewing it on screen, uh, we want to provide people an option to, to make the maps as well. Yes, sir. We, we have not with either of them, uh, but that's a good idea. I, I think eventually what, what I see, where I see us going is uh, not, not to invoke uh, any sort of movie uh, vernacular. Uh, I think it's going to be more of a federation, uh, I think, with, with both public and private entities to build this thing. You know, we, we've built it with, with data that we can control and kind of our priorities. Sometimes it's hard to mesh those with private entities and other governmental jurisdictions, but it begins with the conversation. Yes, sir. There was uh, an option to download the, uh, the CSV from uh, another set of square foot totals. Right. Is that by the Washington Yes, I'm going to say, unless Is the CSV, does that give a parcel level total or is it rolled up? Parcel level. Okay, yes. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to get into that today, but if, if you want to remember, it's uh, R. Luis, L-U-I-S, uh, Regional Land Use Information System. You can get uh, the parcel geography and, and the parcel level de land use as of 2000, okay, so 2015 and forecasted. Well, thank you all for coming today, and, and I hope you enjoy these maps.